Gary King served for 12 years in our state legislature and ran for Congress in 2004, losing to Steve Pierce before being elected Attorney General in 2006. He is the son of the late Bruce King, who served three non-consecutive terms as governor, and Gary King announced his candidacy for governor in 2012, marking the third time he has run for the state's highest office. Gary King, Attorney General, now Governor candidate. Let's start with education in this state. Thanks, Martha. Yeah. We have the lowest graduation rate. We're certainly in the lowest tier. And you have said we're over-testing kids, but there has to be some accountability. Let's talk about what you would do to change that, particularly in regard to this graduation rate that we really need to bring up. Agreed. And, and, you know, when I was in the legislature, we developed a program that we called um, the Family Focus Center. And, and, and we were never able to, to push that into all the schools. It was a pilot program. It was very successful. But the, the idea behind that program, and certainly the idea that I would have as governor, is, is to do something that gets parents more involved. And the, the Family Focus Centers had parent volunteers in the evenings. Uh, it, it gets parents and teachers together. It gets students to do a lot of things that the, in, in the school that, that are the kind of things that keep them excited and good learners. And so um, for graduation rate particularly, we need to uh, challenge our students and we need to keep them uh, engaged in, in their education. And, and that's one of the problems with all of this standardized testing is that it, it, it's really been a, a real morale problem, not only for teachers, but for students as well who, who hate to come to school when, when they know it's just all about being standardized. But talk about that balance between accountability and over-testing. There does have to be some way to measure how they're doing. Yes, and, and, and I, think, I think that we know how to do that. I think our professional educators know how to do that. You know, one of the things that we've done is we've taken teachers out of the system of accountability in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, you know, I've been working with a, with a group of teachers who are working on, on not only how to make the, the students accountable, but also how to make the teachers accountable. I, the teachers that I know are not opposed to some sort of evaluation. Um, they, they are opposed to being evaluated based upon how their students are doing on standardized testing. And so, so a peer evaluation system of teachers I think will help. Uh, I, I think that we're losing our master teachers right now because they're not engaged in the system either and so our best teachers are leaving the state and going somewhere else. So we need to, to make mentors out of our master teachers. Um, we know that, that if, if teachers are engaged that the students are going to be engaged and so rather than trying to understand how our students are doing um, you know, in relationship to everybody else on a standardized test, we should be looking at our graduation rate. We should be looking at whether children can read in the third grade, in the fourth grade, in the fifth grade. Um, but, but it's not all just about the metrics, it's about developing programs that are designed to help those students that don't read well in the third grade level to, to catch up with their peers. And, and those are the kind of things I think that we need to do. Well, it sounds like teacher pay is a part of that. I know you have talked about teacher pay. Uh, you would raise it and just quickly tell me how, how quickly you would do it and how would, how would you pay for it? Sure, and, and there are a couple of ways to do that. One, one is I, I worked with a group that helped develop the three-tiered system, which, which was a system that improved teachers' ability as they, as they gained knowledge and, and experience to move up in the system and to improve their pay. One of the things that I found wh while I've been working here is, is that um, uh, I talked to a science teacher who was about to get his Ph.D., and it turned out that if he gets his Ph.D., which would be great for the students, uh, he would get like $5 more a pay period in his, in his paycheck. And so, you know, we, we, those are not the right kind of incentives need, to need get to teachers to want to be better and, and to do better. Um, where do you get the money? I, you know, I, I certainly have been working for the last three years on this proposal to take uh, money from the, the permanent fund and, and use it for education, both for early childhood education and also to increase the, the amount of money. It's actually not money from the permanent fund, it's money from the flow of money into the permanent fund. We, we have money so that comes from royalties and such time. that flow into that, but, but to take a small piece of that off and dedicate it to education. Okay, let's move to the economy. You've talked sure. about giveaways to corporations. You say that when the corporations get the tax breaks, the people have to make it up. Uh, what would you do to change the tax structure, particularly in regard to economic development? 
Sure, and uh, you know, I think that we really, it's time for us to take an overall look at our tax structure, but um, one of the things that occurred, uh, you know, with the, with the governor's uh, tax cuts for corporations that, that, that were passed two years ago, um, is that, you know, I suppose there's supposed to be some trickle-down effect, but I think that trickle-down theory has, you know, we found that trickle-down theory doesn't really work. And so, um, so I think that um, one of the problems with that too is that the way that we were paying for that is we're forcing the cities to increase their gross receipts tax. And gross receipts tax is one of the most regressive taxes that, that we have. Um, in, New, in New Mexico, and we've done some things to try and deal with that. We took the gross receipts tax off of food. But, but when I was in the legislature, we actually had what was called the low income tax rebate. So we had a broader gross receipts tax, but then we had a rebate system for people that are at lower incomes to help them offset that. And so we've given up on all of those sort of forward thinking tax ideas, and, and now we're just um, in this idea where if, if we lower the upper tax rates, that, that that's going to solve all the problems. And I, and I don't think that that's true. So I, I think that we have to look at, um, at, at our tax structure. We, I think we have to look at the, the, the whole thing. Um, and well, let, let's talk about job creation specifically the fact that we are the highest state in poverty rate, we are the slowest in recovering jobs from the recession. Yes. So how specifically would you address that dual problem, high poverty, not enough jobs? Well, I, you know, I, I think that, that our focus should be on small business in New Mexico. I mean, you know, the, a lot of focus in, in the past years has been on trying to bring in, you know, the big whale, you know, the A corporation that, that brings in 6,000 jobs. And, and I'm not opposed to that. I mean, Intel has been a big economic driver in New Mexico. My father actually helped recruit Intel in New Mexico. So I, but I think that, that if we focus just on that and forget small business, that, that we're making a huge mistake in, in New Mexico. So. Uh, so my plan would be to, to increase our, um, you know, we have this program now that's a job training program where, where we help businesses in the first year if they hire new employees to, to pay part of the salary of those employees or part of the training cost. I think that we should probably expand that so that it covers three years instead of one year. That would encourage companies to stay here and not just take advantage of that for one year and then leave. Um, and so, you know, we would have to Would you do a clawback if they did leave? I, I think that we should have clawback language there if they do leave. I think that, that the companies that come, we, we should want them, if, if we're going to be uh, dedicated to them, they should be dedicated to us. And so I, I do think that that would be important. Um, I think that developing programs in our universities and in our community college system so that, so that we're creating uh, young people that have um, high-tech jo high job skills it w is going to be important. And we've, we've kind of done that in the movie industry. We now have two or three programs in our universities that, that that train people to be, uh, you know, the technical people that, that work in the, in the movie industry, and we've been successful in that in the television industry. But we could do that in aerospace. We could do that in uh, alternative energy sources. We, we could do that in a lot of places to generate those, those folks. Well, quickly, the minimum wage, you've said you want to raise it. You haven't said how much. What would you do with sure. that? Well, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a pragmatist, and so I'm for increasing the minimum wage, and I think that a $10 minimum wage is, is something that, that is achievable. But, um, but I don't think that, that we should give up on, uh, for instance, this last year, two years ago, the legislature increased the minimum wage to 825. The governor vetoed that. I think that that was a mistake on the governor's part, that we should, uh, you know, if we can bring it up in a, in a reasonable way, that that's a good way to do that. Let's move over to the social justice issues, which you do address on your website. You mentioned the Albuquerque ballot measure and that you helped defeat that, but you don't mention the word abortion at all. Are you pro-choice? I am pro-choice. Okay. So, and I and actually I have a, a history in the legislature. I, I actually chaired the uh, what was called the Consumer and Public Affairs Committee, and so so we pretty much had all of the abortion bills, all of the uh, equal rights kind of bills, same-sex marriage. You know, in, in those days it wasn't so much about marriage as it was about just uh, equal treatment under the Human Rights Act. And so I have a voting record on all those. People can look at my voting record. So pay equity, of course, is also a social justice issue. So is sex discrimination in pay. Yes. I know your office has been sued over that. It's, it's been plagued with problems. Uh, you did do a settlement without admitting any guilt. You mm -hmm. did refuse to uh, release any records on that case. Uh, as governor, how would you deal with the gender pay gap? Sure, and, and actually, uh, you know, interesting enough, when you say that the office has had problems, that's, a, that's actually not true. I have, I've been sued, but uh, recently the, there was one of those cases that did go 
uh, all the way in trial, and the, and the court ruled specifically that there was no gender inequity in my office. So I, so I actually have a court ruling uh, that looked at my office and said that there wasn't. We settled two of the other cases because it, it frankly was f financially reasonable to settle those cases, but uh, there's never been any gender inequity in my office. The, the, the top uh, prosecutors in my office, the top management in my office uh, have been primarily women, and so, so our office has been really good on those issues. You're behind in fundraising. You have the highest recognition in name, and you're ahead in the polls. Are you going to win? Oh, I, I intend to win uh, both the primary and the general election. Thank you very much, Gary King. Thank you.